Hey everyone. Well, it's great fun to know that uh, Anthony will be sharing his uh, a subset of his research with us today. Um, I consider him an outstanding scholar of religious studies. Uh, his work has tremendous breadth covering everything from indigenous texts. Oh, I'm supposed to click continue. Uh, religious, indigenous texts, history, anthropology, uh, historical religious practices, current religious practices. Uh, he is very interdisciplinary, uh, drawing on methodologies from religious studies, anthropology, history, and visual arts. Uh, his interest going, uh, I think, in religious architecture, uh, no doubt, uh, has something to do with his own personal life. Uh, his father was a painter, uh, did a series of work on Jewish mysticism. Uh, his wife is an artist. Uh, and originally, Anthony was going to, uh, he started studying art himself um, and expanded into music. And a, a fun note is that um, he co-wrote the musical score, uh, score for what he describes as the worst play ever to be performed on Broadway, which is a distinction that um, many of us cannot even begin to lay claim to. Uh, he started with an interest in South Asian literature, but fortunately for all of us interested in Southeast Asia, uh, he traveled to Thailand uh, to visit a brother and uh, got interested in Thailand, fell in love like so many of the rest of us did with everything Thai and worked for a time in Chiang Rai, which uh, turned out to be a blessing for me because it's very rare that I have the opportunity of working with somebody who also not only enjoys speaking Central Thai, but also uh, Northern Thai, so we could act, we actually interviewed together. Uh, he helped me with some of the research I was doing in Chiang Rai, where I was learning that, and a very important lesson, that um, although a lot of us talk about Northern Thailand and Lana Thai as if we knew what we were talking about, uh, we actually are just talking about whichever region we did our own research in. So I would get upset with uh, Anthony for saying things about Chiang Rai that I knew were not true for Chiang Mai. Uh, and it took me a while to learn that just because it was true of Chiang Mai did not mean that it could be generalized to the rest of Northern Thailand. And Anthony has gone beyond uh, uh, my own uh, skill set and has been not only learning to speak Northern Thai, but also to read and write in Northern Thai, in addition to his uh, earlier. Uh, studies of Sanskrit and Pali. So he brings all kinds of uh, depth to his work. And uh, he did his master's on Sema stones and uh, his PhD. Um, he was evidently uh, foretelling uh, President Biden uh, by who is building back better. So his dissertation was building Buddhism in Chiang Rai uh, Thailand, a uh, construction as religion. Uh, he's received various grants, uh, most notably from uh, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Robert Ho uh, Family Foundation for Buddhist Studies, uh, Fulbright, uh, Australian National Research Council, where he worked with uh, former colleagues from uh, UW Madison. Uh, Ken and Kieran Narayan. Uh, he's taught here at UW Madison at the University of Michigan, Siena College, and he is currently uh, on a postdoc with the Society for Humanities at Cornell University. And today he'll be sharing his work on magical swords from Northern Thailand. So uh, welcome and thanks for joining all of us, Anthony. Wow, thank you, Catherine, for your overly generous comments and praise painting me in the best absolute light. I really appreciate it. <laughs> to clarify, my score was not performed on Broadway, but merely embellished a play that had been on Broadway. Uh, but we're here to talk about something else. 
uh, I want to first, you know, I, of course, thank you to Catherine, my beloved Ajahn. Um, I want to thank Siasi staff, Lisi, Dottie, Jindamore, Dr. Mike, um, and say hello to you Siasi students out there. I myself was a Siasi student, a particularly bad Siasi student. Um, and I want to just tell you that, you know, even though Siasi is hard, it's worth it. And the struggles you endure this summer will shape your futures for the better, undoubtedly. Um, and on that note, I most importantly, I want to pay proper respect to my language teachers over the years, um, without whom this talk and my work wouldn't be possible, but also my life in general would most likely be in shambles. So special thanks to the late Ganika Elbow, Ajahn Bob Bickner, both Ajahn Pacharins, uh, Ajahn John Panit, Ajahn Sithorn, and many more. Thank you all for changing my life. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen and begin. Like most people who encounter magical swords, I would imagine, I did not go out into the world looking for them. It was early January as my motorbike zoomed down the highway between Chiang Rai and Chiang Mai, following a set of Burma shave style road signs stuck amongst the drying out vegetation along the shoulder. The signs spaced about a kilometer or so apart invited passers-by to chun ruom ngan fang luk ni mit puk pata si ma teng si ma ti sip song teng sip bat makara kom song pan ha loi ha sip jet or in English to come participate in the collective burying of luk ni mit and establishing pata si ma from January 12th to the 18th 2014. The last of the signs stood at the entrance to Wat Bong Lue a typical Northern Thai village temple festooned with colorful flags and banners to mark the coming celebration. These signs announced what is one of the rarest and most significant ceremonies in the life of a Buddhist temple, the establishment of what is known as Sima space. Most temples only hold one of these ceremonies in their existence. And for small villages like Bong Nua, it is the zenith of Buddhist activity. Sima is a Pali and Sanskrit word that simply means boundary. There are many different kinds of Sima space, but today in Thailand, the area located around an ordination hall within the bounds of a Buddhist temple uh, is, a, is a class of Sima space that is separate from any public, private, or royal claims and is completely the property of the community of monks. The small parcel of land that is consecrated is completely donated to the community of monks by the reigning ruler, in Thailand, of course, this would be the king who, through the office of the prime minister, prime minister <laughs> forfeits all use of fructuary rights over the land. Once consecrated, this land is where important Buddhist ceremonies take place. Maybe most crucially, the ordination of new monks. Sima space is ritually established in an elaborate ceremony that sees the cooperation of monastic, state, and lay involvement. The ceremony that has emerged over the 20th century in Southeast Asia, Asian countries, looks something like this. Nine large stones, known as luknimit, are suspended over large holes by rattan or white cotton string. The stones are ritually buried by nine elite patrons who cut the supports with ritually produced swords. Participation in this ritual is usually secured by generous donations. Cutting the rattan is considered to be one of the most spiritually beneficial rituals in the Thai Buddhist repertoire. This is because the classification system imposed by the National Office of Buddhism for Buddhist spaces. Only after consecrating Sima space are temples considered to be a full temple or Wat in Thai. Once classified as a Wat, temples are considered to be complete or Sombun. This is the final act of physical construction that completes what is often a long process of temple building. To wield one of these swords that cuts the supports in this ritual then is believed often to produce as much merit for the participant as building an entire temple. That's a lot of merit. I had written an extensive master's thesis on the development of Sema space specifics in the trans-regional network of Buddhist monastic and elite exchanges over the second millennium. But before visiting Wat Bong Nia in 2014, I had never been to an actual Sima consecration ceremony. 
So when I noticed the road signs a few weeks earlier from out the window of a transit van, I was ecstatic and determined to attend. I was visiting the temple about 10 days before the ceremony. I dismounted my motorbike in the temple parking lot and introduced myself to some of the young monks who were hanging around. I asked about the upcoming festival and said I would like to come and do research there. One of the monks was tasked with bringing me around. We passed by the Luknimit, suspended in tangles of rattan over their holes at the front of the Wihan, the building slated to become an ordination hall, or Ubosor. Once inside the Wihan, I was shocked to see hundreds of swords piled up on a platform at the center of the room, connected to a matrix of white string that linked them to the principal Buddha image. The young monk I was with started to dutifully explain to me what Sima space was. I was distracted. I was already, already familiar with the basics he was talking about. And in my excitement, I cut him off. Well, what about all these swords, I asked. Those are for cutting the rattan that holds up the lukni mit where they are buried, he answered. I thought there were only nine, though. Why are there so many, I continued. At many temples, there are only nine, he explained. But here, we will have about 500. In my amazement, the young monk told me that I could make a donation to the temple to obtain a sword of my own and be permitted to participate in the collective burying of the stones that marked the Sima area. I was convinced. And someone, somewhere in our conversation, the monk explained that the swords had just been consecrated the night before in an all-night ceremony known as a puta apisek. The large Buddha image that dominated the Wihan had been re-consecrated that night, and these swords were literally tied up together in the powerful matrix and transfer of energy that activated the Buddha image. These were no longer normal swords, but were thus imbued with the same power that sacralizes Buddha images and Buddha amulets. There were a variety of sword types and lengths piled together. Most of them were sheathed in either wooden or mother of pearl inlaid scabbards, but there were nine unsheathed blades set in a row of wooden stands. These, the monk explained, were for the largest donors who had given the most money and would be permitted to deal the final blow to the rattan, thereby sending the stones into their holes. These blades had the typical recess curve used in Sema ceremonies I was familiar with, as I looked closer, I noticed that each sword had a piece of tape with a donor's name written on it. And beneath that, the blades were embossed with decorative markings and sloppy looking writing that must have been done with a jeweler's drill or a Dremel tool. I later learned that the writing was a special kata or prayer written by the hand of a highly achieved local monk known as Kruba Insom. Kruba Insom had written this prayer on each of the hundreds of blades on the platform and had also overseen the consecration ceremony the night before. According to Kruba Insom, this prayer transforms these swords into what are known as Dap Sarikanchai, a class of very powerful magical swords present in the Northern Thai corpus of Buddhist legends and history. But more on Dap Sarikanchai, Kruba Insom, and his embossed kata later. Encountering this large pile of swords in this Wihan began a long process of researching the importance of ritual swords in Northern Thailand, how they are made, why they are considered powerful, and how it has come to be that ceremonies that once included only nine swords now feature hundreds, each wielded by a lay ritual participant who collectively work to achieve the establishment of the religious and political category of Sima space. My presentation today is about how the political and religious power and possibilities of space is tied up with the power and possibilities of materiality, legends, communal identity, hopes for a better life, and maybe most pressingly, accessibility. Focusing on the role of what I am casually calling magical swords in Northern Thailand provides insight into how objects are vessels for carrying meaning and power, but are also often functional tools with which people actively change their worlds. I understand these swords as magical in the sense that they are capable of affecting change in the world by means outside of what is typically expected from their material properties. I am not interested in extrapolating a general theory of how material is imbued with magical properties beyond the techniques and theories presented in the Northern Thai tradition. I take these swords as capable of affecting change in the world along the lines theorized by Northern Thai Buddhists. This study 
is about how those changes are connected to a corpus of ideas and images housed in Northern Thai texts, rituals, and casual notions. In this sense, these swords are simultaneously magical and utilitarian. While imbued with powers from a number of sources, the swords in the context that I will be discussing them are most helpfully conceived of as tools. That is objects that are wielded in the hand and used in a manner that changes the world around us and within us. With these tools in hand, Northern Thai Buddhists engage in a form of active religion. One that involves the body operating within space to collectively affect change through material and kinetic activity. Another word for the body operating within space to affect change through material and kinetic activity is building. In short, here I am showing how and why swords are crucial tools in the process of building Buddhism in the here and now for devout individuals and communities writ large. By building Buddhism, I mean that people in collaboration with these magical swords define, delineate, and discursively manifest Buddhist ideas, spaces, values, and relationships in the world that is immediately accessible to them. To fully grasp how and why swords afford powerful possibilities for no Northern Thai Buddhists, I will examine a number of sources about magical swords from Northern Thai Buddhist history, presenting a sort of cultural biography of magical swords by looking to the realms of rituals, chronicles, rumors, art, and architecture to understand how the biographies of auspicious objects are actively constructed by Northern Thai Buddhists throughout time. First in this talk, I will discuss the way these swords were distributed and wielded at Wat Bong Nua before the Sima consecration ceremony, lingering on how the swords are positioned as objects that materialize Buddhist political power and are connected to Buddhist ideas of cosmic time and rebirth. After that, I will discuss how access to this once restricted ritual object has been democratized and opened up to many people by a pair of ritual entrepreneurs, a craftsperson and a spirit medium who happen to be married to one another. Then I will explore the perceived power of these swords to their related bladed counterparts in Northern Thai understanding by reviewing a number of stories, legends, and texts that deal with swords and their connection to state power, political autonomy, and Buddhahood. I wanna be very clear that some of the content I am presenting today, especially the things that come from Buddhist texts, but also some of the things that people have said to me or directed me towards are not universally known by Northern Thai Buddhists. Instead, they are the result of my looking of my research process and the paths that asking certain questions have led me down. It is wrong to think that I ask the same kinds of questions as Thai Buddhists. And therefore, I must emphasize that I am not presenting here a definitive treatise on why swords are important to Thai Buddhists. Rather, what I am presenting is a survey of sorts, one that attempts to show certain facets of the open and active role swords in Northern Thai Buddhist, uh, uh, role of swords in Northern Thai Buddhist ritual, history, literature, and playful banter. Why this is important is because it shows somewhat of a kaleidoscopic vision of how the devout experience power, repeat stories, invent traditions, and make their world, worlds legible, tangible, and moldable, and how they achieve these ends in concert with material objects or tools. The same day that I first visited Wat Bong Nua, the swords were moved to a table set up just outside the ritual area surrounding Wat Bong Nua's to be consecrated ordination hall. For the nine day festival leading up to the Sima consecration ceremony, this table was a hotbed of action. Monks, novices, and members of the temple council took turns holding court behind the table, microphone in hand, inviting festival goers to sponsor a sword at different monetary levels, dep depending on the size and style. Even sponsoring one of the cheapest swords, however, secured the right to participate in the rattan cutting ceremony, which I did. Here's what the cheapest sword looks like, which I used in the rattan cutting ceremony. Between playing carnival games, eating snacks, watching dance and musical performances, participating in mass donation rituals or papa, and drinking copious amounts of alcohol, people joined the solid line at the table to sponsor a sword. 
After making a cash donation, people wrote their names on printouts that corresponded with the type of sword they had sponsored, and at which of the nine Luk Nimit they would cut rattan. As people sponsored swords, the master of ceremonies announced their names over the microphone and extolled the virtues of participating in the ceremony, saying that Sima is the root of the religion and that cutting rattan delivers the most merit or boon out of any Buddhist ritual because each temple only has one Fang Luk Nimit ceremony. Amidst the sound and activity, people took their swords with them as they walked back to the festival scene. At an opposing table, a group of novice monks sat with piles of paperwork, a laptop and a printer, typing the names of donors into a spreadsheet that was then printed out. The individual names were cut into paper strips that another group of novice monks took into the ritual area and affixed on the individual strands of rattan wrapped around the metal structure supporting each luknimit. Throughout the nine day festival, people wandered into the ritual area to find where exactly their names had been placed indicating the exact spot that they were to cut during the ritual. On the morning of the ceremony, Wat Bong Nia was flooded with hundreds of people dressed mostly in white, over 400 of them, each holding their own personal rattan cutting swords. The crowd was made up of local villagers, people from Chiang Rai and Chiang Mai, and pilgrims for as, from as far as Bangkok, who had driven all night to attend the ceremony. The sea of white clad bodies was punctuated with bright spots of orange as over 200 monks arrived piecemeal throughout the morning. I spoke with an extended family that had tra traveled 800 kilometers from Samut Brakan, especially for the ceremony. This was their third rattan cutting ceremony in the past four years, and they were determined to participate in a total of nine. They reported that it was commonly held that cutting the rattan in nine separate Fang Luk Nimit ceremonies produces so much merit that rebirth in heaven was guaranteed. With every ceremony they attend, the members of this family obtain a new rattan cutting sword. Each of these swords are kept in their home as a particularly powerful object that serves both as a memento of their pilgrimage and items of veneration. They are held to be Siri Monghon, objects that bring fortune, luck, and prosperity. Specifically, the rattan cutting swords have the power to protect the home or Fauban and prevent any type of malignant spirit or force from entering into a house that has one on its shrine. Two safety demonstrations were held for the ritual participants led by a smartly dressed middle-aged man. I later learned that this man was Kun Khan, the head craftsman who, along with his spirit medium wife, Kun Mao, were the producers of the hundreds of swords for this ceremony and the innovators of the mass proliferation of Sima consecration swords in Northern Thailand. As the monks ate their mid-morning meal, Kun Khan presented at the Luk Nimit directly in front of the entrance to the building. Wearing a white suit with a white Bluetooth earpiece in his left ear, Kun Khan juggled a wireless mic, a sword, and a rolled up piece of paper in his hand as he gave practical instructions on when one should cut their allotted portion of the rattan and how to safely hold the sword. He also took the opportunity to explain a bit of the specifics about Sima space that people might not be aware of, that the land had been given fully by the power of the king to the Sangha, and that now that it has been given, once the ceremony is complete, the land status as consecrated Sima space would exist in perpetuity forever until a time when it would be ritually deconsecrated. At the end of his spiel, an elderly gentleman holding two swords moved close to ask Kun Khan a clarifying question, at which point Kun Khan clicked his mic back on and said, quote, this man has asked a good question. He asked if women were permitted to cut in the ceremony. Then Kun Khan began to ad lib for emphasis. Can children cut in the ceremony? Could a pregnant woman cut in the ceremony? Then he finally gave his answer. There is nothing that can prevent anyone from participating. None of this would cause that word kut, which is a Northern Thai word that means discord, bad luck, or misfortune. There is nothing anywhere that says, this one can cut and that one can't. There are no pro prohibitions found anywhere in the Vinaya. Anyone, man, woman, child, they all can cut. When a child cuts, then that is the barami of the child. It, way, it may one day become the barami of a Buddha. Kun Khan then dispersed the crowd by asking them to please go and find their names on their designated strips of rattan. Condensed within Kun Khan's instructions and answers here 
are very important aspects of what makes these swords powerful. Their ability to change the quality of space and the spiritual qualities of individuals over long spans of cosmic time. Theravada Buddhism presents a cosmic temporal frame that is incalculably long. People are reborn again and again into countless lives over countless eons. Kun Khan's casual explanation of Sima space as existing in perpetuity is set within this temporality. Once the land has been consecrated, that status remains forever. Indeed, an important part of the Sima consecration ceremony is the deconsecration of the land of any previous Sima spaces that may have been established there in the past. This is because Simas that overlap are invalid. So to be absolutely sure that the Sima being consecrated does not overlap with any cosmically ancient Simas spaces from trillions of eons ago, the land is first deconsecrated before it is consecrated anew. The second statement of Kun Khan's that works within that expansive Buddhist cosmic temporality is his statement that, quote, when a child cuts, then that is the barami of the child. It may one day become the barami of a Buddha. Barami is a spiritual quality of perfection necessary to one day become a Buddha. Barami is cultivated through various moral and ethical activities, like building temples or giving away your children to old Brahmins, but that's another story. We already heard about that family that believes that if they participate in nine cutting ceremonies, they will be reborn in heaven. But what Kun Khan was getting at goes past that relatively short scale benefit. Instead, Kun Khan was activating a long span time frame that encompasses the eventual birth of future Buddhas well beyond the immediate future. There are many Buddhas that have come and gone in the Thai Buddhist understanding of cosmic time. The next Buddha to come is, though, is known as the Maitreya or Pra Arya Metai Buddha. But there will be Buddhas after him and maybe the child who cuts today will one day be reborn as one of them. Indeed, the idea of a child with a special sword eventually being born as a Buddha in the future lines up with a number of stories in the Northern Thai Buddhist corpus of ideas that I will explore later in this talk. For now, I wanna talk more about how it has come to be that Kun Khan and Kun Mao are at the forefront of Sima Speech ritual innovations, which is part of my larger work that deals with how craftspeople are crucial to religion. There have been numerous arguments and clarifications concerning Vinaya laws ruling on how the monastic community should go about proclaiming and establishing Sima space. Nowhere in the Vinaya, the laws for monks or any exegetical commentaries though, are the non-monastic elements of the ceremony discussed. This provides ample room for ritual innovation to occur before and after the monastic portions of the ceremony. Kun Khan and Kun Mao have emerged as leaders in the non-monastic makeup of the Sima consecration ceremony. They organize about 30 cutting ceremonies a year, all of which feature hundreds of their swords. This couple is so tied in to the organization of these ceremonies that when I went to interview the government official who works at the Office of National Buddhism branch in Chiang Rai, the one in charge of Sima consecration ceremonies provided me with a PowerPoint presentation he shows to monks and temple councils. The PowerPoint presentation spells out all of the things the temple community needs to prepare before the ceremony, right down to how to arrange the shrine to the king by the side of the entrance to the ritual area, which holds a large portrait and the official government documents granting the temple the right to hold the ceremony. When I asked this official if he had made the PowerPoint himself, he said, no, I got it from this man who makes swords. This guy was referring to Kun Khan. But Kun Khan and Kun Mao were not always at the top of Buddhist ritual organization. Kun Khan was born into a knife-making family from Lampang. He spent his early life making knives and machetes or meat for agricultural work and peddling them at markets around the country. He told me that during this time in his life, he was really a scoundrel, a drunkard whose life was a mess. He and Kun Mao married, and they settled together at a market close to the Chiang Mai Lampang border. Then in the late 90s, he said that he and Kun Mao's life changed. They were at their stall in the market when some devout Buddhists came to them. The people explained that they were sent by the highly powerful monk Kuba Wong from Lampun to come to this market and find a man who makes knives and machetes. 
Kun Khan and Kun Mao were surprised. They, of course, knew of this famous monk, but were themselves not especially devout. The Buddhists told them that Kuba Wong had chosen Kun Khan to make swords for an upcoming Sima consecration ceremony that he was leading. Kun Khan had never made ritual swords before. And on top of that, he said, he was really a hard drinking craftsperson, not really interested in getting involved with a monk. But after he and his wife talked it over, they agreed to take on the work. From then on, Kun Khan and Kun Mao were Kuba Wong's designated sword makers. Kun Khan stopped drinking and they both started keeping the five precepts. Their lives started to improve. They were making swords steadily for Sima consecration ceremonies run by Kruba Wong's large monastic network. And Kun Khan and Kun Mao started to attend the ceremonies themselves, helping with logistics and organization. These ceremonies were the typical ones that featured only nine swords wielded by very, very elite patrons. Then in 2004, Kun Mao had a revelation at a ceremony they were involved in at a particularly poor village. Kun Mao recalls watching the cutting ceremony and thinking about how important the ritual was to Buddhists and the large amount of merit obtained by the people who cut the rattan. As she watched the elite patrons inside the ritual area, she began to think of her own mother and how upsetting it was to her that her mother, who she loved dearly, would never have the opportunity to take part in such a spiritually beneficial ceremony. Then her gaze widened and she began to look at all of the villagers politely sitting outside the ritual space. She began thinking of all of the old women in the village, how they would never be able to participate in the cutting ceremony, just like her mother. Quote, I wanted to give my mother the opportunity to go and cut the lukni mit, and I also thought of other people's mothers, and I thought this, I want to give all people the chance to cut the rattan, Kun Mao reported to me. The couple then consulted with monks about the feasibility and possibility of increasing the number of cutting patrons. Since the cutting ceremony isn't even mentioned in any Buddhist scriptures, the monks informed them that nothing prohibited this change to the ceremony. From that point, Kun Khan and Kun Mao began increasing the number of swords available at their ceremonies. While they began slowly with only three to 10 swords per stone, they now run ceremonies that can feature up to 600 cutting patrons in total, each with their own personal swords. Over the 10 years that unfolded since Kun Mao's revelation and when I first met them, the couple's work increased parabolically. They now run a huge operation of modular village-based production enterprise that they utilize to mass produce the thousands of swords they provide every year. They took me around the villages where the various craft and production processes to make the swords are carried out. As we drove from place to place, they explained to me that over the last five years or so, Kun Mao has become a spirit medium for King Naresuan, the king of Ayutthaya who ruled from 1590 to 1605 over the Northern territories now in Thailand. King Naresuan is one of the historical heroes of Thailand. And as we drove around, Kun Mao took calls in the front seat from people consulting with her on life decisions. She would hang up, become silent, and then call them back, reporting what King Naresuan suggested for them. This is important because, as Kun Khan explained to me later, Kuba Wong, the monk who first got him involved in making ritual swords, had in fact been the father of King Naresuan in a former life. Therefore, Kun Mao's connection to King Naresuan tied into the work that they were that they began doing with Kuba Wong in the late 90s. While telling me this, Kun Khan and Kun Mao also set their ability to accomplish such large scale production in blunt materialist terms as well. When I asked Kun Khan why he was able to have such a leading role in the Sima consecration ceremonies around Northern Thailand, he told me that it was simply because he was in possession of a large store of rattan, which was becoming more and more difficult to obtain. His access to the means of production is not divorced from the cosmic connections that Kun Khan and Kun Mao situate themselves in. While explaining to me how he obtained the large amount of teak needed to make hilts and scabbards for his swords, Kun Khan played a little game with me. Ask me if I asked the government permission to get teak from the forests, he said to me, setting himself up for one of his signature jokes. I began the question he had set for himself. Do you ask permission from the government? No, he cut me off. King Naresuan is the owner of the forests in this, in this area, and I have his permission to access them. 
emphasizing the importance of Kun Mao's role as a spirit medium with direct access to the lingering mind force or jit of this king who died at the beginning of the 17th century. However they obtained their resources to make their swords, Kun Kan emphasized to me that these swords he created are in a class of magical swords known as Dap Sari Ganjai, and that he was taught how to produce these swords by Kuba Wong, the monk who first got him involved in making swords for Sima consecration ceremonies all those years ago. Kuba Wong's connection to this special class of swords may be the result of his monastic lineage, which draws back to the most famous monk from Northern Thailand, Kuba Sibichai, seen here on the sword table at Wat Bong Nia. Kuba Sibichai's connection to the Dap Sari Ganjai gained scholarly attention recently from Catherine Bowie, my beloved Ajan, who introduced me. Kuba Sibichai was said to possess this particularly powerful magical sword, which Bowie connects to his status as a millenarian figure and his political power in resistance to Siamese expansionist forces in Northern Thailand during the first part of the 20th century. There is much that has been said about Kuba Sibichai and his possession of this magical sword is only one of the many aspects of his fame. Bowie's study brings out that the Dapsa Rikanjai is said by many to be the sword of Indra and is imbued with magnificent properties and powers. When pointed at the sky, it can cause thunder and lightning. When stuck in the ground, it can cause earthquakes. When pointed at a sick person, it can cure them. And when dipped into water, it transforms the liquid into a cure-all tonic. It's a pretty powerful sword. The issue of Kruba Sibichai possessing such a powerful sword comes from official charges that were leveled against him during his first trip and detention to Bangkok in 1920. The official charge, which is one of eight brought against the powerful monk, noted a rumor that, quote, a sword with a golden scabbard fell from the sky onto the altar at Prasibijai's Wat, or temple, and he re retained possession of the sword. I'm quoting Catherine Bowie here. Bowie uses C.B. Chai's possession of the sword to argue that he should be contextualized not simply as an apolitical saint, but as indicating his status within the minds of his followers as a bodhisattva for the to-be-born Maitreya Buddha. The importance of C.B. Chai as Maitreya is set in what she calls a millenarian social movement that fomented in the territories north and, northeast, uh, north and northeastern Thailand from the late 19th to the early, to the mid 20th century. As Bowie explains, the Dap Sari Kanjai is the sword of Indra and symbolizes, quote, the victory of righteousness over oppression. To charge Sibichai with possession of Indra's sword was, in effect, to accuse him of spearhead spearheading a millenarian revolt, end quote. Of course, Sibichai denied being in possession of the Dap Sari Kanjai, and he was ultimately cleared of the charges, which, which resolved that it was a rumor started by other people. Bawi situates the generation of this rumor in the economic peril that faced the people of Northern Thailand in the early 20th century. Beset by famine, natural disasters, livestock decimation, increased ta taxation, uh, rise in crime and disease, the people drew on the image of the Dap Sarikanjai as an object of hope in the hands of their chosen charismatic saint. This magical sword was not only considered powerful because of its connection to Indra in the heavens, but also because of its connection to the potential political autonomy of the old Lana kingdom, which has since been, since been incorporated into Northern Thailand. This connection is evidenced by the sword's presence in the corpus of Northern Thai texts, legends, and art, which position the sword as a material manifestation of autonomous political might legitimated by the logic of Buddhist kingship. One place where the Dapsari Kanjai sword pops up in Northern Thailand before Kuba Sibichai's rise to prominence is in the famous murals at Wat Pumin in Nan. Oh, I was supposed to show you this. This is Kuba Sibichai in front of the Maitreya Buddha. But let's turn to the murals at Wat Pumin in Nan. These are possibly the most well-known art from Northern Thailand. While highly reproduced and recognized they depict what is a very rare and little known story. The story of a previous life of the Buddha, particular to Northern Thailand and Laos, known as the Katana Guman Jataka. Indeed, the murals at Wat Pumin may be the only place that this local Jataka, Jataka tale have been painted. Importantly, the murals were painted beginning in 1894, 
the very same year that a large portion of territories previously controlled by the non-principality were ceded to the French by the Siamese as part of a resolution of the Franco-Siamese conflict of the year before, uh, of that year. Before getting into the political possibilities of the murals though, let me quickly tell you a bit of the story. Up in the heavens, Indra, the king of the gods, noticed that the being who would one day be born as the Buddha Gotama's mother was living as a young female weaver. Indra figured this would be a perfect time for the Bodhisatta to be born on earth again, to continue the cultivation of Barami that would one day lead to his rebirth as the Buddha. Indra took the form of an elephant and trampled through this weaver woman's rice fields. The weaver chased after the elephant to spare her crop, and once the elephant was gone, she found herself exhausted and parched. She then drank the water or urine, depending on the telling, from a footprint in the elephant slash Indra, in, th that the elephant or Indra left in her rice field, and then became pregnant with the Bodhisatta. According to contemporary understanding of the story, here is what happens next, which I take from a master's thesis on the murals by Ms. Chatsurong Gaobentong from Silpakorn University. Quote, then she gave birth to a baby boy with a beautiful and radiant complexion, which marks the birth of a highly achieved, achieved spiritual individual. At the moment he was born, a dop Sarikanjai, which is a magical sword, fell down from the heavens nearby. His mother then gave him the name Katana. Katana is imaged in the murals, always carrying his beautiful sword, which he notably uses to save his mother from a giant. The giant pleads for its life, gives Katana some gold and a magical vessel full of an elixir of youthfulness. The story continues with Katana Guman traveling around on various adventures with his powerful sword in tow. It is important to return to the historical and political context in which this mural was painted at Wat Pumin. The mural was com commissioned by the then King of Nan, Zhao Suliapong, who hired a painter originally from Lao, Tit Guapan, to head the project. The story is an ad adaption of the Sihananda Jataka that is present in Laos and Northern Thai texts, but not found in the central region. David Wyatt, in his reading of the murals, highlights the theme of orphanhood in the story, connecting the fatherless katana to the principality of Nan itself, which had been orphaned by the Siamese. By considering the story and the prevalence of the Dap Sari Kanjai, we can read even more pointed commentary into the King of Nan's choice to commission this story. Not only is the boy orphaned, he has his father's sword. This sword can be read as representing an indigenous form of politico-religious power. While it is very possible that the story of the sword falling to earth at the moment of Katana's birth is a latter addition, possibly grafted onto this mural from the time of Kubasiwichai. In the present context of how the stories are told, it doesn't much matter. Now, the sword in the hand of Katana is understood to be the Dapsarikanjai, one and the same as the one that Bowie brings out in the Sibichai biography. It would be enough to simply say that the sword is important, powerful, and politically and religiously charged because of its connection to the god Indra and the long span cosmic biography of the Buddha Gotama in the Katana Kuman story and the Maitreya Buddha in the Sibichai case. However, the corpus of Northern Thai texts provides even more fodder for us to analyze the importance of this sword beyond the millenarian contexts of Katana and Sibichai. For this, I now turn to the Chiang Mai Chronicle. The Chiang Mai Chronicle relates the legendary history of the kingdom of Lanna from its founding by King Meng Rai in the 13th century to the resurgence of local rule in the area in the early 19th century. It was written in 1827 as a single document compiled from earlier sources and new embellishments. The Dap Sarikan Jai sword appears many times throughout the document. First, as evidence of Meng Rai and his descendants' celestial and lineal right to rule, and later as the magnificent object that is used by the Zhao Zhedong dynasty to reunify the territory in opposition to two centuries of Burmese rule from uh, 1550s to 1770s. According to Saraswadi Ongsakun, the Zhao Jetton were of commoner background and claimed ownership of the Dap Sarikanjai sword as a means of securing their legitimacy to rule. Furthermore, 
The spike in chronicle writing in the 19th century, of which the Chiang Mai Chronicle is a product, was a legitimating act initiated by this dynasty in order to, quote, construct a sense of heritage around itself, end quote. The Dap Sarikan Jai as a palladium of Lan Na royal power may have been emphasized by the 19th century historians who compiled the chronicle from earlier sources. While it is possible that the primacy of the Dap Sarikan Jai in the Lan Na imaginaire was the product of, le of the legitimizing campaign of the Zhao Jeton dynasty, it is also likely that the Zhao Jeton dynasty chose an object that was already circulating in the active mental universe of 19th century Chiang Mai. There are many specific portions of the chronicle that feature the sword, but I am skipping them in the interest of time. If you are interested, I am happy to share them. The accounts of the Dap Sarikan Jai uh, do not lie dormant within the text of the Chiang Mai Chronicle. Instead, these objects are active repositories of meaning in the lives of Northern Thai Buddhists. This class of swords serves as an important legitimizing implement of royal regalia for the ruling Lana elite of the Ping and Gulp River valleys. These objects are intimately tied to ideas of local autonomy, and this meaning has remained embedded in the Dap Sarikan Jai into the 20th and 21st centuries. This all seems tight and neat. The Dap Sarikan Jai that Kruba Sibi Jai was said to possess and the one that Katana Kuman wields on the murals at Wat Pumin in Nan were the swords of Indra, powerful narrative devices that embodied La Na autonomy. The swords afford millenarian possibilities and resistance to Bangkok rule in the North because of their connection to King Mang Rai's unification of his kingdom, and more recently, the Zhao Jeton's expulsion of the Burmese from the Ping, Kok, and Mekong river valleys throughout the late 18th and 19th centuries. A few months of, after digging out the history and textual reference of Dap Sarikan Jai in scholarship and Northern Thai texts, such as the issue of Kuba Sibi Jai and the Chiang Mai Chronicle, I was taken up to the mountains with a couple of the monks from Wat Bong Nia. We went to visit Kuba In Som, the highly achieved monk who had consecrated the rattan cutting swords for the Sima, Sima consecration ceremony that occur, occurred earlier in the year. Kruba In Som is a specialist in magical swords. He consecrates swords for ceremonies all over the country, and his powers are highly sought after. He has special Dap Sarikan Jai talismanic diagrams, known as Yan or Yantra, that he inherited from his monastic teacher, Kruba In Kam at Wat Tung Fa Pa in Masui Chiang Rai. The Yantra is written in black ink on mulberry paper. It features three swords with different decorative hilts each inscribed with different Dua Mung Kata or Northern Thai prayers. I have an image of this yantra, but I am not sharing it here because I do not have his permission to do so. When we visited, the elderly monk sat on the floor in a prayer hall in his temple, cutting sheets of metal and embossing them with a stylus, making a form of amulet called takrut, where yantra are written in a grid on the metal surface, and then the entire thing is rolled into a tight cylinder. We spent many hours with the monk as he received visitors who requested different duck root from him for various purposes. Eventually, the monk took some time out from his task to speak with me about swords. During our interview, I began trying to show off all I had learned about Zap Dap Sarikan Jai, that they were the swords of Indra and that Kruba Sibi Jai had one. Kruba Insom was quick to cut me off. He told me that the Dap Sarikan Jai weren't only the swords of Indra, but the swords of the Buddha. Right, I interrupted. I know the story of the Bodhisattva with the sword and began explaining to him the Katanat Guman story from the murals at Wat Pumin. He cut me off again and clarified that the Dap Sarikan Jai he produces are not swords of Indra or the Bodhisattva, but the Buddha Gotama and his disciples. These are the moments during fieldwork when your neat typology falls apart and you realize you are dealing with an open system of meaning making in which people engage with texts, materials, and power to change the contours of their worlds. Humbly, I politely asked Kruba In Som to explain how the Buddha and his disciples had swords. He then told me that it came from a moment during the Buddha's life when he defended his kingly patron, King Bimbasara, from the threats of a powerful neighboring king named King Jambupati. King Jambupati was threatening an invasion of King Bimbasara's kingdom in ancient India, 
but the Buddha came to the rescue. To do this, the Buddha instantaneously transformed himself into a decorated monarch, complete with palace, crown, throne, and attendants. Kuba Insom explained that the Buddha also transformed his retinue of monks into his ministers, attendants, and armed soldiers. This episode came from the Jambupati Sutta, or the Tao Mahachamhu in Thai, a lesser known, possibly apocryphal story of the conversion of King Jambupati, who, upon seeing the Buddha as monarch and his magnificent palace and attendants, abandoned his designs on King Bimbisara's kingdom and became a follower of the Buddha. Most of the scholarship done on the Jambupati Sutta had, has been in the realm of our history to account for the elaborately decorated and bejeweled Buddha images found throughout South and Southeast Asia that gained popularity in 15th century Lanna. In terms of art history, these images are said to possibly overlap with images of the Buddha Maitreya, who was often also imaged in royal regalia or uh, Song Kruang in Thai. For Kruba in Som, the Jambu Pati Sutta is not a story to explain art historical traces, but an actionable description of the resonant power of the Buddha and a store of efficacy that activates the yantra he uses to create his Dapsari Ganjai. When the Buddha transformed himself and his disciples into fully appointed courtiers, they possessed swords as part of their regalia. The Dapsari Ganjai that Kruba In Som makes are these, and his special yantra is capable of producing three distinct swords, that of the Buddha and his two main disciples, Sariput and Mokalan. For Sima consecration swords, Kruba In Som uses the prayer for the Buddha Sari Ganchai, which has special protective qualities. In the King Jambu Pati story conveyed by Kruba In Som, again, the importance of political autonomy flashes off the blade of the Dap Sari Ganchai. Which brings me to a close with the Sima consecration ceremony at Wat Bong Nia. As the nearly 500 ritual participants hacked away at the strands of rattan that held up the Luk Ni Mit above their holes, they did so with a specially consecrated Dap Sari Jai, a material manifestation of the political autonomy of their local region. At the same time, this sword was a tool that affirmed their participation in a ritual dependent on the moral authority and territorial control of the king in Bangkok and the administrative mechanisms of the office of the prime minister. The status and power of the swords used in the Sima consecration ceremony is connected undoubtedly to other storied blades in the Northern Thai literary, scriptural, and discursive corpus. The line that these swords themselves cut through the necessarily related realms of state power and millenarian resistance reveals how religio-spatial realities and political power and resistance are dependent on, and indeed produced by, the magical possibilities of objects. Thank you very much. All right, so we have some time for questions now, and I will be allowing everyone to just unmute. Um, so you can raise your hand and ask questions directly, or if you do prefer, or if you don't have the tech capability, like Larry, you mentioned, um, you can type them and put them in the chat. I think Catherine has her hand up. She literally oh. has her hand up. Oh, <laughs> there we go. While everybody else is uh, uh, waiting to or thinking through what they would want to ask, I, I of course have lots of questions, but um, I'm curious about the connection with Kuba Wong, uh -huh. um, who in many ways was quite conservative uh, yeah. in terms, you know, very strict vegetarian, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm a little surprised, I'm curious about the relationship with women because in the Chiang Mai region, the Sima stones would be around the Upasot and not the Wihan. And the Upasot women would not be allowed to enter. So was Kuba Wong in on the spirit mediums a precocious decision that it was cool for women to be involved in all of this? 
I didn't ask them specifically, but given the timeline that they give, it seems like this developed after he died. Um, to clarify, so what happens a lot of times is a Wihan will be built and then it will be consecrated and then it becomes an Ubosot. So this, and this we've gotten into this many times before Catherine, right? But um, they'll build a large Wihan and uh, which is which is not similar to the small ubosots that are typical of of older Chiang Mai temples, but they build a large vihan, and then after many years, once they raise the money, once they get the permission from the state, etc., then they bury the luknimit. They have the consecration ceremony. So then that vihan turns into an ubosot. Um, and you know, I also you know I on, on, I did a, a survey of temples in Chiang Mai. In which we're asking, you know, what, mostly thanks to you, right? And you're pressing like at the temples, like, well, are women allowed in the Ubosot here? And the vast majority of them, the women are allowed in the Ubosot in the Chiang Rai region. And this this temple is kind of is halfway between. Um, and and Masue also, there's a lot of the women are most for the most part allowed in. Um, there's there really are only a handful of temples in Chiang Rai, at least in the in the city where women are, per, are, are not allowed to go into the Ubosot. And the answer always given to me at temples was, well, lay people, all lay people, no lay people are allowed inside the Ubosot. It's only for the monks. When they have those small, the small Ubosot, it's only for the monks. Um, so women aren't allowed because there's not, well, there are female monks, but for the most part, the majority of monastics in Northern Thailand are men. And did Wong know anything about the connection with, uh, that it was being asserted about the relationship with Narisuan? Or is this all the uh, after he died? I, I didn't ask them if Kuba Wong knew about that. It's it seems like the the their, the opening out of the ceremony itself and the the uh, Kun Mao's being a medium for Narisuan comes later. And the way they explain it, her, her becoming a, a medium for Naresuan is because of the amount of barami that they've cultivated through running these ceremonies and making the swords. But you know, you know, Catherine, how it goes, right? People <laughs> like they, they um, are very creative and active in how, the, in how they're engaging with the religion. And they may have been devotees of Kuba Wong um, but deviated from some of his more conservative stances um, as they're creatively building what Buddhism is for them. Yeah, it's fascinating. See, I'm getting here. Nathan, hello. Oh, hello. Um, yeah, very, very interesting lecture. That was uh, fantastic to, to listen to um, and learn about. Um, when did Kuba Wong pass away? Is he's, yeah. Kuba Wong passed away what, in 2002 or 98. I don't, I don't exactly remember the exact date, but just around the turn of, right. Catherine, do you know the date exactly? It's, it's like the late nineties or early. Um. It's kind of interesting to hear, was it um, Kun, the maker of the swords was from, you said it's from around Ayutthaya up here, or um, Ayutthaya area? Lampun, or Lampang, Lampang. He's from the Lampang area. Oh, he's from Lampang. Yeah, actually, from that, there's a village right by Wat Lampang Luang, the, kind of, I think, behind Wat Lampang Luang, which is a... A, a traditional knife maker's village or meet you know the people who make knives and he grew up in that village and was trained from a young age in this sort of fa family enterprise village enterprise of making machetes and knives mm -hmm. okay cool cool interesting we also had a question from jennifer unless you have another question nathaniel no i'm just uh taking it all in thank you yeah Okay, I'll just go ahead and read it. So the question is, 
uh, would you please compare the Sima space and ceremony in Northern Thailand versus in Cambodia? Um, I, I can't really, I've never been to a Sima space consecration ceremony in Cambodia. I know a little bit, I mean, uh, in Cambodia, I'm, I'm pretty sure, well, Eric, uh, Eric Davis, right, in his book, Death Power, writes about this. And I think he has a couple of articles about it as well. Um, in Cambodia, there's, they use mostly size in the white string. I don't know what it's, what it is in Kamai. Um, but they also, they, they use a blade and they use a cudgel to cut it. So it's like one person will hold the blade, I think, and someone else will, will use a cudgel to hit the blade. So then it cuts the string and then the, the Sima stones fall into the holes. Um, uh, I don't know. You, you look, look at Eric Davis's book, Death Power. It's a great book, not just so that you learn more about the Sema space consecration rituals in Cambodia. And also then I can plug, there's a, a large edited volume that's coming out on Sema, on Sema spaces, co-edited by Eric Davis and Jake Carbine um, that's coming out from Hawaii Press in December. And there's going to be, there's actually a, a whole portion of that book is like a special um, focus on SEMA space in Cambodia. So check that one out when it comes out. Okay. Other questions that people might have? Guess I can look at the chat also. There's a comment from um, Jib that Kuba Wong passed away in May 2000. Uh, what else? Cambodia wedding sword, a sword is part of the ceremony? Question mark. Did you ask that, Nathaniel? I think so. So, <clears throat> what I didn't get into in this is so the there's a, there's a, a royal Thai sword, the sword of a king, which is the Kanchai Si, right? Um, the Dap Kanchai Si. So it, and that comes from, from Cambodia. I think the sword itself is from the Khmer, the from Khmer kingdom. Um, so, you know, I mean, swords are, are all over the place in, in royal regalia and things like that. So I, I, I haven't done the work. But I don't know if anybody would if somebody wants to do the work, it would be great about the relationship between this, this, this Kamai sword. Oh, Matt True, I think has been talking about working on it. So uh, about the relationship with, between the Kamai Kanchai Si sword, I think it's, they call it the sword of victory or that's Sari Kanchai. So it's like Kanchai Si and Sari Kanchai, they sort of like spoonerisms of one another, the word, the names. So there's gotta be some sort of linguistic history and deeper history between the relationship between the, between the swords but that work hasn't been done yet. I think the, the mute function must be preventing people from unmuting. Oh. I was just gonna say, it's kind of interesting to see the bluing of the blades. Um, that was something I had more commonly seen among the, the swords that you see from, from Nampi, from Uttaradit. Yeah, so like the, the actual treatment on the blade, the bluing, you mean? Mm hmm And it's, well, you know, also like the steel that they use, there's definitely bluing, but the steel that, that he's using is just this sort of ribbon steel. And it's, yeah. it's, you know, this is like a, this is a bargain. This is 1,000 baht, right? It's like, mm -hmm. and so it's, there's definitely higher quality blades and it, they might be trying to mimic that, you know, the Lek Nampi from Uttaradit, which is, you know, considered this very auspicious mm -hmm. metal and it's, it's magnetic, right? Um, and it has other, so maybe it's, it's part of just the aesthetics of these blades is that they'll have that, that tinge on them. Yeah, I think the general model for like the swords that you see in Thailand comes from um, like around the UT. I'm trying, I'm blanking on the name of the, the village. And supposedly I think those craftsmen were supposedly brought to around the Udia area from, from Laos, I think during different periods where the kings had brought craftsmen, things like there. 
and then that general type spread out to um, yeah, other parts of Thailand, that specific type where they, you know, it's a more modern version where instead of pounded steel that they draw out, they have this um, you know, more modernly where it's, yeah, it's a shape cut from, you know, a sheet steel and then uh, used with a grinder to right. uh, do that and turn fittings, turn metal fittings, turn wood fittings with a rat tail um, tang with a screw end. Yeah, but then the 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 swords that are typically used uh, um they also call them knives or you know meat 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 or dop sometimes the ones that are used in the semic consecration ceremony with that recessed blade mm -hmm. that one looks you know that one looks to me it's like the gurkha the gurkha sword um which that maybe came through through burma right or was brought by uh by like pashtun peoples i don't really know right like how that how that style became popular for the for this ritual sword sometimes they say that uh some research that that is from the alexander the great from the greek uh, uh, like the copus or whatever kind of like their falchion you see um yeah some theories uh, i guess everything that everything that um has to do with the gurkha or northern india eventually goes back to alexander the great right mm -hmm. the running narrative yeah. We have time for a couple more questions. Catherine, can I ask you a question? Did I, Catherine, did I, did I properly represent your article and your argument? <laughs> That's always nerve wracking. When Dan said you're going to introduce me, I was like, uh oh, I better, I better, I better get it right. Yeah, I better get it right. I, I was waiting for the social justice part, but you brought it in. So, well, the subtext of this talk is, you know, that I did bring it in, but the subtext is that this is, you know, January 2014 when I went to this ceremony, which is when, you know, the uh, PDRC was like things were popping off in Bangkok. There were, they were occupying the streets it's like the day before the 12th you know the 13th or something right that's when there was a lot of violence going on in bangkok so um i was i don't know i haven't written that part up yet and i don't know if i will but you know the the symbolism of the sword the symbolism of northern aut autonomy set against all of this stuff going down in bangkok um and cause, because people they're also they're participating in this it's basically state pageantry a lot of it Right? There's, you know, of course, there's a parade, there's the pictures of the king, there's a shrine to the king. It also absolutely rests on the authority of the office of the prime minister. So, you know, like on the on the state documents that the temple gets, it's signed by um, the office of, you know, from, and it, it lists from like Ying Lak, it has a signature that they say is Ying Lak, right? And so, um, of course, this is before Ying Lak was um, deposed, is that the polite word for it? Uh, but so, you know, I, so how, how do, so, I mean, the spirit medium and the, and Kuwait in, in, in zone and the, the sort the, I can't remember his name. Now. Um, Khan, yeah. the, the three of them seem to be very influential in creating this whole ever elaborating story. What are their, what are their politics? How, how do they position themselves? For example, against the Kuba Siwichai story, where Kuba Siwichai is a symbol of the North against uh, Bangkok. And yeah. how do they position themselves with Nare Suan? Because Nare Suan, I mean, Sulak Siwarak was right. He was a bloodthirsty monster. Um, and, you know, would have suppressed the North, not liberated the North. So how, it's always interesting to me to see this whole new cult of Nurisuan that's been developing. It's sort of like, don't you people know your own history? Um, so I, what are their politics? Well, the politics are, um, I, would, I would say that they're uh, red, red shirt sympathizers, right? Um, and, and also the, the whole thing with Nurisuan, like when, when, when um, Khan, like when Kun Khan, when he told me, you know, asked me if I asked the government for permission to get this teak, right? He's like, no, I don't need it because I have King Norisua. And 
it still it reminds me of at one point i think it was during one of the jataka uh, i think it maybe was one of the conferences or you know uh, talking about the um the santra jataka maybe it was for your book uh we're talking about like the how the santra jataka is like used also to critique king kingship in many ways right and Anne, she she chimed in and said well yeah but you know critique of kingship is not a rejection of kingship right and in a lot of ways it can reinforce monarchism and 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 establish for people what 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 they want ideally want right so there can be this sort of romantic idea of Neresua maybe for King Khan, Khan and male um, that is this sort of uh, this great past that is now gone and they can use that to critique the legitimacy of Bangkok power. Okay, there's that, but then there's also, she's also a spirit medium and, and, and using this logic of Zhao Kong of ownership, right? The King Neresuan is the Zhao Kong, the owner of these forests. And, and that's like, that also goes, I mean, with the idea of CBGI re renovating all these temples around the North and uh, um, that idea of, it's only the person who is the actual owner, the Zhao Kong, of these territories that has the political authority to do anything with it. Um, so their political stance is, I would say at the time, you know, they, they definitely um, are doing things to assert authority, local political authority and autonomy, but at the same time, engaging in these state rituals, you know, of, of the state pomp and, and ceremony. So is it, are they being deviant or are they being, res are they resisting? It's like this sort of creative resistance, I guess. It would actually be fun to, uh, to, to actually trace how this whole cult of Nar Narisuan has been spreading across the North. Like, who are the individuals? You know, I mean, they're making these roosters. <laughs> I can see all over. And I, I actually went with my Thai family, uh, Northerners, to the Camp Naresuan, and everybody was all excited, you know, to get a rooster. Right. Uh, and how this all got off the ground is a fascinating transformation of the actual relationship of the Northern region with Naresuan. So it would be actually fun to do some more interviewing to find out how people are interpreting Narisuan. And after they've given their version, ask them, you know, double check on, and what about this part of the story? <laughs> That's in the history books that us foreigners read. Yeah, right. It would be like, <laughs> we don't care about that part, <laughs> maybe, you know. <laughs> but right, the, the Narisuan shrine, there's a big shrine, a Narisuan shrine, on the same road that Bong Nui is on, the, 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 the highway that goes between Chiang Rai and Chiang Mai, and it's it's all roosters, right? And then it's all swords, but you know, there's an image of Nere Suan, and just the whole, the whole like sala, it has walls built of swords. It's just, it's like, um, it's just all these sword racks and there's just uh, like hundreds of swords that are, I guess I should have put a picture of that in, but, um, but I haven't done those interviews about Nere Suan exactly, right? I don't know who's making the roosters. I know who's making a lot of the swords, though. That'd be fun just to add to the list when you're when you're doing your interviews. Yeah. Just, uh, add, add another question. And... You need a good title. Cock a doodle do. <laughs> Naresua, the, the, emer the emergence of King Naresua in northern Thailand. There. Well, I, I was. Right. I was with. <laughs> I was with uh, some uh, Bangkok. Uh, rich Bangkok friends who were um, giving money to various northern temples. And this one wheeler dealer abbot was, he had made a statue of Naresuan at his temple, which was in Chiang Mai province. And then uh, uh, from the view on the hillside, he pointed, he was pointing to my, my Bangkok friend saying, and um, we think this is the, the direction that Naresuan came from Burma. Uh, it passed right past this area in front of the temple here. And I go, yeah, right. <laughs> right. I mean, or another, another um, 
I took another friend to meet some people at the wood, a wood carving village just outside of Chiang Mai. And, and this carver who runs quite an operation had a carving of uh, Pratnarai and was telling everybody, telling these Bangkok people that this is the most important deity for Northern Thailand. And I was thinking, wait a minute, what happened to Indra? Um, you know, it, it was like Narai and Vishnu and what? So it, it's kind of intriguing how uh, Northerners are, are doing backflips and front flips and all kinds of interesting transformations as Bangkok's influence grows. Yeah, but and also engaging in, in like modes of resistance as well, right? And it's it's hard to pull apart the un to, to untangle what's resistance, what's um, adaptation, what's adoption, what's you know, is it just Bangkok influence? Like people, they also have agency in how and what they choose to amplify, and the way that they choose to amplify it. So, yeah. Any last questions or comments? Well, thank you so much for your talk, Anthony. Um, thanks so much for coming out to Seasi. Uh, big round of applause, although virtually. We wish you could have been here in person, but you know, it is what it is. And we hope to see you around soon, though, at UW Madison. It was my pleasure. Long live Seasi. Long live the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. Long live Catherine Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> and long live Dr. Mike. <laughs> okay. All Very right. Good. And la long live Larry Ashman also. Yes. <laughs> okay. Long live all of us. Yes, indeed. Sounds great. Thank well, you. Thank you all for coming and hope to see you at upcoming Seasu lectures too. <laughs>